Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning on this glorious October day. Um, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're joining us in worship. We're glad that we're welcoming new members. You probably can't hear me, can you? I hope someone in the sound room can turn up my volume. I know, there's, there we go. I prayed for volume and I got it. How about that? <laughs> Um, welcome. We're glad you're here. We're welcoming new members this morning, which is always a day of special celebration and joy. Uh, but there are many reasons for that this morning. So if you would please center your heart and enter into a spirit of contemplation as we prepare to worship together. Will you join me please in the call to worship? I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from God who made heaven and earth. Let us worship God together.
O Creator, O immensity of love, O eternity of mercy, come and be with us and in us and beside us and over us. Be as warmth within us and fire us for caring. Be as strength beside us and shape our lives for healing. Abide in our prayers, the spoken and the unspoken, and make your word come true in our flesh through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. may be seated please good morning we welcome you one and all to this service of worship uh, we have five services on this day we hope that you're blessed by this one and we're glad that you're here among our uh, many celebrations today we celebrate new members coming into the life of the church uh, who will be introduced a little bit later and that is always a celebration and we're very glad that you are with us for sure uh, find that tablet near you put your name on it pass it to the opposite end of the aisle if you would please especially if this is your first time uh, for further information about the life of the church, uh, make sure as you leave today, there will be somebody at the Welcome Center who will help you with any kind of information that you might need uh, right away. And they'll be, as I said, very glad to help you uh, for sure. Uh, First News Sunday is what we call your attention to every week. Uh, that is this piece that we spend a lot of time on to make sure that everything is there uh, for a faithful guide the one that you put on the refrigerator so you'll know what's going on the weeks ahead. I might give you a little bit of a heads up is that next Sunday we will have this same worship schedule north and south that we have. The following week uh, will be Solidale Gloria and we'll be at the North Campus at 9.15 and 11. And then following that, we are going to have our new schedule that you see printed on the front here. Uh, I am kind of a, a worrying kind of guy that you might get lost in the midst of it. So we'll call your attention to it each week about what the schedule is now and what's coming on up. So I didn't want you to get lost there uh, along the way. So I wanted to uh, mention that to you. Uh, could I ask right now, uh, children, K through the eighth grade, where might you be? Are you here today? We have Kirsten here that's going to escort you on out. Uh, this is your time to go to class. Thank you for being with us. We always like you being with us. And we also send a prayer with you that you'll be blessed in all of your gathering on this particular day. I have a further announcement that I wanted to make here about child care needs on Sunday morning. Uh, Kate Heyer is a uh, young lady who works with our early childhood development. She's a really sharp lady. Sat down with Deb and myself this last week. And they are in need of two lead preschool teachers uh, for the North Campus and one lead infant toddler teacher for the South Campus. And they need volunteers. Uh, some of these are paid positions, others are volunteer. The teachers must be 18 years and older and uh, the volunteers can be 18 and under. There will be plenty of supervision and guidance along the way. So what I'm going to tell you, if you know of anyone or if you are interested yourself, if you'd see Deb following the worship service, just give her your name and then Kate will call you. Kate can't be here because she's busy with the little kids right now. So and she's doing a great job and we want to give her some support. So I wanted you uh, to know about that for sure. Uh, at this time, uh, we are going to ask uh, Rebecca Wolf to come forward. Uh, Rebecca was a lay minister in the Disciples of Christ for a period of time, also a principal of a school, uh, came here in retirement but didn't want to retire and wanted to do something uh, significant. And lo and behold, our trading post was needing somebody like her. She's discovered kind of a little retail part of her soul and has expressed that there. The, the profit that we make there uh, goes directly into all kinds of mission programs, and for that we are grateful. She has just brought it to a whole new height, is also sitting with our stewardship committee, and she's coming forward right now to share with you a moment of uh, stewardship. Uh, Rebecca, uh, I've been dragging her around all kinds of services, so you need to welcome her in a special way. Right now, please.
Good morning. <laughs> I remember vividly as a junior higher opening this magazine and this little ditty, this little poem almost jumped off the page to me and it said, the more you get, the more you give. The more you give, the more you get. This system hasn't failed me yet. And for some reason that really struck a chord with me and so at my ripe old age of 13, I started my first job as a waitress in our little ice cream shop in my hometown at 35 cents an hour, so you can tell how old I am. Um, and I decided I was going to start giving back to God through my little church, and that hasn't stopped. And I found throughout my life that I have never been able to outgive God. So Gary and I give to First Community Church not because the church needs our money, but we give in gratefulness of everything that God has continued to give to us in our lives, good times and bad. We never are able to outgive God. But God does need a base, a foundation from which to do the work of Christ in this world. We need the bricks and mortar buildings, we need lights. We like to have that air conditioning when it's hot in the summer, and on a chilly day, we're glad there's heat. We want to have classrooms for our children, and we want to have programs to help us to learn and grow. We're very happy that we have pastors and counselors who are there for us when we have times of need, or when we have a son or daughter who wants to be married, or a loved one who needs to be buried. So it's very important that we give, but not just because this is our church, but because we have this need as human beings to give back to the one who gives so much to us. So I hope that this little ditty will stick back in your head for a few decades. The more I get, the more I give. The more I give, the more I get. This system hasn't failed me yet. And I can guarantee each and every one of you here today, you will never be able to outgive God. But I sure hope you'll have fun doing it, as Gary and I have throughout our lives. And so today, if you don't have a pledge card yet, there's some available in our Brownlee Hall, or you can go online and sign up there. But I know in my heart that each of you will want to be a part of God's great work on earth through First Community Church. Thank you. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Your response is before you in the bulletin. I'm reading from the Sermon on the Mount, and it's a paraphrase. A paraphrase is as if to say. It's modern language seeking to express as best we can in our own language what Jesus was seeking to get across. And so I share this with you. Your response is there in the bulletin. Jesus says, don't pick on people. Don't judge don't jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer that is on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? 
It's this whole traveling road show mentality all over again. Playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Don't be flip with the sacred. Banter and silliness give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogans. In trying to be relevant, you're only being cute and inviting sacrilege. Jesus concludes this section by saying, don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. The word of the Lord. You may be seated, please. As you clearly know by now, we have been in a sermon series, Things the Bible Does Not Say. Uh, we're looking at part five today. Next week, we'll kind of do a recap and look at some of those and ask if there isn't something better that we can say in the place of all of these cliches along the way. Most of them that absolutely uh, do no good at all. But, you know, only the hand that can write has the privilege to erase. And so I hope that in this series, you just haven't found me up here uh, griping or getting things off my chest. We really owe it to each other to find a better path than some of those that have been there uh, in the past. And so we're looking today at love the sinner and hate the sin. I love the choir uh, for so many reasons, not only the gifts that they give, but also they're a good fun bunch. Uh, whenever they get together. And individually, they got their own sense of humor. So just before I came in today, uh, somebody gave me a card. They said, you know, Dick, this had uh, your name all over it, uh, given the fact that you are doing this sermon series on things the Bible does not say. It's a card. It's really kind of nice. It's got a nice uh, ocean scene on it. It says, there's probably a Bible verse that would be perfect right now. Too bad you have heathens for your friends. And so, uh, for, for whatever that's worth, he said, I knew that would fit. And even though this cliche is not found in the Bible, uh, it kind of sounds like a good idea. Really, you know, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. What could possibly go wrong? And uh, you have it at the top of your bulletin. Bill Coffin, who stood in this pulpit, tells you exactly what goes wrong. He said... If we hate evil more than we love the good, we become damn good haters. However deep our anger, like that of Christ, must always and only measure our love. Now you got it in your bulletin. Take that bulletin home and contemplate that. That last phrase in particular. Yes, uh, we need to be angry about uh, hunger and uh, the lack of human rights and all of these kinds of things. But it must be measured, first of all, by the amount of love that we bring to that particular issue. Sometimes we just like to get off, and that's his point, to do the hate, the anger part, but never get around to the construction part. So my main point today is anything you give anyone permission, any time you give anybody permission to hate, 
To hate an act by another human being, what happens eventually is hate for the person more than the act. Mahatma Gandhi has been uh, uh, misinterpreted around this very thing, misquoted, if you please. He said in 1929, hate the sin and not the sinner. Well, you say, it's right there. This is what he's saying. But we always end the sentence right there. Now, stay with the sentence, and this is what he said. Hate the sin and not the sinner is a precept which, though easy enough to understand, is rarely practiced. And that is why the poison of hatred spreads in the world. And the church has been on the forefront of that way too many times because now we have the permission to hate and and cajole people and bring people to conversion uh, with a sword in our hand. Because of all of that, that, the hate stuff comes on out. I repeat, any permission of hatred of an act will eventually lead to justification for hating the human being who does that act. Jesus never, ever gives permission for that at all, ever. And the Christians, you know, as we look through the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it the, the turning the other cheek part that we skip over the most with our need for justice and for revenge, if you please, or getting back, or they need to pay up, and all of that? It just not as found, it's not found in the heart of Jesus, we know that. People will oftentimes identify Deb, myself, everybody on the staff as these liberal preachers uh, who are criticized most of all for not talking about sin. But you know, I need to remind you, I talk about sin every week. Every week I talk about sin. But I try not to use that word, but it's correct definition. The Greek word sin is hamartia. Essentially means to stray from the path or to miss the mark like an archery. I think we can understand that. So if I said, would all sinners please raise your hand here today, you would not want to raise your hand because everyone would say, uh, gee whiz, I, she's got her hand up and I wonder if her sin is worse than mine, you know? We just don't do that here, nor is it productive at all. Uh, Garrison Keeler, I miss him already on uh, Saturday evenings with a Prairie Home Companion, one of the best preachers in all of America, uh, he would say on, in one of his uh, monologues, he said one time, he says, when a preacher gets up in the pulpit and says, well, folks, you need to know that I'm only human. Immediately the congregation determines in, he's talking about adultery and they want to know with who. <laughs> That's Garrison Keeler. But, you know, if I said, is there anybody here who's ever strayed from the path that you thought was best in life? Our hands would easily go up and mine be the first. Or if I were to say, how many of you have missed the mark in life on occasion? You were, you're aiming a particular direction and, and you clearly missed it, either on purpose or, or by accident or by strain. My hand would be the first up. Paul states it this way. All have missed the mark. They've strayed from the path and fall short of God's glory. And only by forgiveness are we restored to that path, he would say, and find the right target in life. And so... I suggest that we unpack this just a little bit today. Uh, Let's identify, first of all, that maybe we could insist that uh, there's a half-truth here. And I've said it's the first part of it. The first half of the statement is true. Love the sinner. If we stop there, we're in good shape. But Paul writes in 1 Timothy, this saying is reliable and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul adds, and I'm the biggest sinner of all. He wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. I'm the biggest sinner of all. If Jesus didn't love sinners, he couldn't love Paul, and he certainly couldn't love me, and maybe some of the rest of you. This might be a shock to you, but the single thing that uh, I learned from a man mainly out of the 1950s, his name is Norman Vincent Peale, Uh, I didn't read a lot of his stuff. He was the guy that was doing the positive thinking type stuff there and uh, encouraging people. A lot of people were helped by him. We have a woman in our congregation who was baptized by him. And I tell her I can see that warm glow every time you come into the room. Uh, That's not true, but she likes it every time I say it. Uh, And uh, he was the one that challenged uh, all of the put-down preachers in America by saying 
Go to your New Testament and recognize Jesus never called a human being a sinner. Never. Many people who had strayed from the path, who'd gotten lost in life, uh, who had missed the target in life, they came to him with lesser and some of them very great things that they found forgiveness for in his presence. You know, there's a professor by the name of Frank Kemper, and I'll never forget this, in a class, and I was stunned when he said it. It was a counseling class in seminary. He said, when you are understood, you are forgiven. Jesus understood. And people found forgiveness in his presence. Even the woman who caught in the very act of adultery, those kind of images kind of blow my mind. Along. What did this look like? He did not call her a sinner. What did he say? Neither. Do you like neither better? Either way, neither do I condemn you. Go your way. And uh, not only did Jesus not call a person a sinner, but Jesus never said, love the sinner. What he did say, and this is a very, very important distinction, he said, love your neighbor, which is everyone, and most especially the one closest to you, in deep need. So Martin Luther King, in the heat of the 1960s, when it was hard to find some people that were really uh, loving their neighbor in an appropriate way, he said, I declare to you tonight, love your neighbor, and if you can't, at least don't do them any harm. So if that's where you need to start, that might be a good place to start. Love sounds like a little bit too much, but maybe you start with don't do any harm. Luke introduces the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector with these words. Jesus told this parable to certain people who had convinced themselves that they were righteous and who looked on everyone else with disgust. Have you ever met a person like that? I'm telling you, I've met them, and they're no fun at a party. They are the ones who say, if you can't say anything nice, come and sit by me. Uh, and that leads me to my next point about judgment. The second is don't judge. I call this the good deal. This is the best deal that you can get biblically in Matthew, the seventh chapter. I'll put it personally. Dick, if you give up judging others, okay, as you ought to, okay, you will not feel judged. And you will feel judged to the same degree you judge others. In modern psychology, we call that projection. Uh, because it is so difficult for me to deal with those aspects of my own life. It's really difficult. Change is difficult. You can never say change lightly because it's so difficult for me to deal with my very short suits. I just project them on you, and I judge most harshly in you that which is my own weakness. It's the way it works. It's happening every day in many of your offices and in everyday life everywhere you go. So as he did so often, Jesus used a graphic, memorable metaphor. Uh, this one, I think, really brought a big laugh. Remember these people he preached to, they had like zero education, no education, and they were very poor. And so he was using those parables. He used those metaphors. That's all he had. They could not read. They could not, either. not that there was anything in print to do. He couldn't even scribble in the ground and give them something. And he used that one, the comparison of the splinter in your brother's or sister's eye compared with the log in your own eye. You know, can't you imagine Jesus standing there and say, now look, you guys, don't look at that speck in another's eyes when you've got a log sticking out of yours. That's hyperbole, and it, frankly, was kind of funny to the first people that heard that. The church that bears his name has had thousands leave it recently because the church has done what Jesus told us not to do, and that's to judge others. All churches and all of its manifestation, east and west, is struck by this uh, today. It's true of the Roman Catholic, the Protestant, and all forms of fundamentalism. Uh, a lot of people have gone away as they see the hypocrisy uh, of that. May I say in parentheses, too, I'm going to have a study group tomorrow night. We're looking at a couple of books that talk about where the church is, where it's going in our society. But I'll tell you one thing about all of that. Right now, the church is going through a period that comes about every 500 years. And about every 500 years, they have a garage sale. And they figure out what needs to stay and what needs to go. And we are really recognizing that rather than be... Uh, 
near any kind of pulpit or church in any of its manifestations. You know, people would rather not be there. They're, they're better off not to be there uh, just for that judgment alone that, that comes to them in that place. And I know what you want to tell me at the door. I think we do a far better job of not doing that here. But the church in and of itself is going through some great changes in that way. There are none that were caused by you individually. There are a lot of them that are cultural and everything else. And it is our privilege in this particular day to look at what is there, what remains of the days in the life that we are sharing together and to find the new paths that we are called to. So my third point, and it'll be my last, Jesus speaks of forgiveness at the very place where people mess up. I thought about this the other day. Uh, My mother came to me when I was a child, and she said, uh, Dick, you need to choose your friends carefully because you will be known by the company you keep. Anybody have a parent like that? Did you hear that? Did I see anybody there? Yeah, that was mom. Now, unfortunately, Mother Mary goofed, and she didn't tell Jesus that. I followed what my mother said. I kind of chose my character. You know, I wasn't, you know, hanging out with some people that were kind of mean and nasty and ugly and all that kind of stuff. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, didn't get that instruction across to him. Jesus spent most of his time with drunkards and prostitutes and thieves, the occasional adulterer, traitors of his own people. They would be the tax collectors who collected the money and were working for the Roman government, but they were jerks, didn't like them. And countless others who undoubtedly had impure thoughts, cheated on their taxes, committed a variety of crimes. We never hear Jesus saying to them, I love you, but I hate your sin. When Jesus speaks to sinful people, he doesn't talk about their sin. He only talks about forgiveness. And there will be a new day in every church, east and west, in all of its manifestations, when that is the first and last word of the church. Uh, God in Jesus also, we find, cannot help an unneedy person. Doesn't know what to do with a self-sufficient, I don't need anybody else. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I, I, I found my own way in this world. God doesn't know what to do with that person at critical points uh, in life. If you want to know what God can work with, go to an AA meeting with me where people stand up and say, my name is Joe, and they might say it five times a week. Go to five meetings. My name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Not until they can come to that point to confess that or uh, with uh, narcotics in You know, I've been hooked on narcotics, and it's hopelessly out of control. At that very moment they say, I need help, uh, is the first step in getting it. And God so much in wanting to be in fellowship with us, who loves us so dearly, (laughs) would like us to stop kidding ourselves and tell the truth about our own lives and then wait for the great gifts that God has for us. Uh, You've no doubt heard people describe why they don't go to church. Um, among the top answers has to do, as I mentioned before, religious hypocrisy, saying one thing and, and doing another. And we're trying to get that all straightened out to, in the day in which we live. I don't know how many of you uh, read the, the New Yorker. I, I like their cartoons for sure. Uh, there was one that was given to me by somebody here in the church. Here is St. Peter standing at the pearly gates. And a person who has just died now is standing in front of Peter. Peter. And um, this person standing there is hoping for admission into heaven. So Peter is paging through what has been called the book of life to see if that person's name is there. And so finally Peter uh, looks at this uh, anxious person and says, Oh, oh, yes, Uh, you were a believer, yes, but you skipped the not being a jerk about it part. (laughs) Not being a jerk about it. We need Christians who are not judgmental jerks. Judgment never belongs to us, but God alone. And I need to close with this. Um, I like Billy Graham a lot. I like him, and I did as a child as we got on a bus and went to San Francisco to the Cow Palace to see him when I was 10 years of age. And we uh, went up there and came back that night, got back at midnight. We thought that was a great thing. And I remember him so very clearly saying uh, that there is only one way to God, it's through Jesus Christ. 
and I understood his theology, and uh, frankly, our church believed that stuff too. And then I followed his pilgrimage into his 90s, and there, sitting with Larry King and others, says, you know, I never know enough to say that there's no human being that God does not love or does not accept. And I appreciated that greatly. Uh, too bad his son hasn't been listening to him. But we can talk about that another time. But I appreciated Billy Graham's growth over time and the widening of his arms that look far more like the arms of Jesus. Now, Billy Graham was going to a banquet in the late 1990s. Um, and he went with his daughter. His wife couldn't go, and so he went with his daughter. And it was right after President Clinton and his wife had gone through uh, the impeachment process for all of the well-known improprieties of our president. And um, Graham and his daughter were invited to sit next to them, and uh, the president and his wife were very kind to them, and vice versa. And as they were going home, uh, the daughter was a little confused about exactly what had gone on in recent history, and so... Uh, Billy kind of went through well, this and this and this and this is what happened and it's been hard for everyone and then he turned to his daughter and said as a minister of the gospel I know this it's the spirit's job to correct us when needed it's only God's job to judge and it is only our job to love and to love always. May God help us to find that path we have too often strayed from and find our way into His deep and abiding peace. Amen. Today, we are welcoming 19 new members into our church family. Uh, many of them are here this morning at our 11 o'clock service, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce them to you. Um, Sue Alford, Greg and Eleanor Trapp, Chris and Stephanie Lenoy, and Bob and Jody Davidek. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. <clears throat> Some of you have come from membership in other congregations and are renewing vows made elsewhere. Some are confirming baptismal vows made for you long ago. Some are professing a brand new affirmation of faith in the way of Jesus Christ. However it is that you have come today, we rejoice that you are here and have chosen to become a member of this church. First Community Church is an inclusive community of faith called to embody God's love through worship, study, giving, and service. We celebrate diversity and believe that all people are included in God's unconditional love and grace. Therefore, we ask you, will you covenant with us to follow the path of Jesus Christ by understanding that the words we use to express our faith are to be lived out by loving and compassionate action. Will you covenant with us to be faithful in worship attendance, 
inviting and welcoming others, enhancing your spiritual journey through study, prayer, and action. Will you covenant with us to seek daily to live and act in ways that help make Christ's example of God's love for all people real, and to support this church and its ministries by giving of your time, talent, and financial resources as you are able? Will you covenant with us to further the work of God's realm and the church universal by standing with those who suffer, loving unconditionally, and serving all humanity after the manner of Jesus Christ? Do you then, as persons who have affirmed these covenants, seek to become one in spirit with the membership of First Community Church? Members of the family of God, I commend to you these persons do all in your power to affirm their faith journey, strengthen their hope, and embrace them in love. We give thanks for the faith God has worked within you. We welcome you wherever you are on your faith journey with our love, acceptance, and respect, and pledge to work together as a community of faith to provide opportunities for worship, education, study, fellowship, celebration, service, and mission, to give spiritual and emotional care and support in times of need, and to be faithful as fellow stewards of God's grace. Together with you and all people of faith, we seek the unity of the Spirit in the bond of Christ's peace, so that in everything God may be glorified. Well, we welcome all of you. We're glad you're here, and we glad, we're glad you found your way to First Community Church. I was so moved by Rebecca's uh, mantra or slogan or whatever it was that she saw as a little girl. Uh, the more I get, the more I give, the more I give, the more I get. I got nothing else to add to that, folks. <laughs> this is that moment in worship where we bring our offering, where we contribute our financial resources to this church that we love and respect and rely on, not only for ourselves, but for our community and the world. So, will you give?
As we are all part of a family of human relationships, so we are all part of the household of God. As members of that family, let us together pray. O oh God, accept these gifts we bring, both the noisy ones and the quiet gifts. We bring all of them to support the ministries of our church, to heal the broken, proclaim good news, educate the young in faith, carry on the worship of God, and prepare us for service in our world. Amen. There is uh, certainly much to be mindful about and to pray about uh, this morning. The devastation from the hurricane in Haiti is almost too much to bear as you look at it on the news. And uh, there are many relief efforts going on, including ones through the United Church of Christ. Uh, but we certainly hold all of those folks in our prayers, as we hold those who have been impacted by the storm in the United States. Uh, the devastation is not as extreme, but you have all have been watching the news. You know that uh, it's still very real. And uh, even the loss of property and possessions, while we rejoice that it's not a loss of life, it can still be very life-changing. So uh, we hold all of those folks in our prayers. You have the pastoral care list in your bulletin. You will see the names of our members who have been recently hospitalized. In addition, there are those in uh, rehabilitation, people who are going through chemo, people who are grieving uh, recent losses and not so recent losses. Um, Dick always says, everyone you meet is carrying someone heavy and something heavy, and we can pray for, for all of those things today. And I will also remind you that our country is a source of prayer. Uh, our ability to be one with each other and to respect each other and uh, work toward the best in all things for our nation. And so we will also raise that prayer as well this morning.
I'm going to suggest that we use the words from the anthem you just experienced as a responsive piece of our prayer. So when I say, Lord, in thy mercy, your response will be, grant us peace. Okay? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we begin first with thanks and praise. We thank you for this glorious October day, for our freedom to enjoy it, and for the liberty we have to gather in this place and speak the words that we believe. Lord, in your mercy, grant us peace. Dear God, we thank you for music that stirs our souls and warms our hearts and reaches us in ways that are deeper and fuller and richer than we can imagine. Lord, in your mercy, grant us peace. Dear God, we thank you for freedom in what we do, in what we say, in what we believe, in what we stand up for. We know that you have helped us to be the people of this nation and we pray for those who do not have the freedoms and the liberties that we enjoy. We pray for those who cannot speak or pray or sing or believe even what is so dear to their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, grant us peace. We pray today, dear God, for our country. These are uneasy and unsteady times. We pray that the wisdom of your people will be steady and strong and caring and kind to each other and to large groups that we may see as the other. Help us, dear God, to be the people that you dream we can be and that you created us to be. Lord, in your mercy, grant us peace. Dear God, we pray for those today who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, those who are on a healing journey, those who are traveling the path of grief, those who celebrate and those who weep. We celebrate and weep with them as we know you do as well. Lord, in your mercy, grant us peace. And now, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, hear us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now let us go from this place with joy to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Oh.